great. Thank you, Natalie, Vicky, David, the entire ICC team. Really appreciate you having us. Uh, we are fully aware that we have about four individuals and 20 to 30 minutes between coffee, between us now and coffee break. So we will do our best to move efficiently, but I don't think we'll have any problem um, given our, our distinguished speakers keeping this uh, engage, engaging and, and lively. Um, so one thing, you know, to, to, to just point out at the beginning um, is, you know, I think our prior speakers had mentioned the increasing complexity and, and the, the landscape that we're now finding ourselves in, um, it, 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 uh, dealing with uh, the development of sanctions over the past few years. And um, one, uh, the ICC released a consolidated guidance on the use of sanctions clauses in trade finance related instruments uh, years back, and it made an interesting observation. Um, it said that the need for sanctions is a political matter outside the realm of the ICC. The enforcement of sanctions is determined by government authorities. And then I'm going to paraphrase this part, but the function of the ICC is to help facilitate best practices to navigate the challenging regulatory environment within that larger ecosystem. So in the spirit of that observation, we have a, a great panel today um, presenting perspectives from a legal and, and, and academic um, position from government and pol public policy, and also from the industry um, with on, on the ground experience. Um, so with that, maybe we could just go down and start with Miriam, just quickly in a few sentences, introduce yourselves. Uh, hi, I'm Miriam Goldby, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello, I'm Miriam Goldby. I'm Professor of Shipping, Insurance and Commercial Law at the Centre for Commercial Law Studies at uh, Queen Mary University of London. Rebecca Harding, Independent Trade Economist and Trade Expert and Strategic Advisor. Anisa Sun, <coughs> Head of Trade Finance at Kona International Bank, Trade Practitioner and uh, looking after the business. Great, thank you all. Um, so we'll start with just a few minutes um, for each of the panelists to speak, and I'll do my best maybe to, to lift this up when we're approaching four minutes and we can begin to wrap things up um, before we open it to a panel discussion um, amongst all of us. So with that said, we can start with Miriam providing kind of the black letter law and, and the, the legal aspect of, of the regulatory landscape. Uh, thank you, Sam. So, so we've heard uh, quite a bit from our uh, presenters, the earlier presenters, about sanctions themselves. So what I thought I would focus on in my four minutes is enforcement of sanctions, um, uh, especially as this is obviously of the most concern to people trading and, and entering into business transactions. Um, essentially, uh, if a, a sanction is in place and you breach that sanction, you will be open, you will be liable to enforcement action being taken against you. And uh, enforcement action can be of uh, two types. It can be a monetary fine or it can be criminal prosecution. Essentially, it's, it's one, of the, one of those two things. And uh, it's worth remembering that the monetary fine uh, um, are, are usually targeted against entities, but individuals can also be open uh, to prosecution. Uh, we've seen some examples of fines against entities um, uh, in the presentations that have just uh, been heard. Um, so let's take an asset freeze an ex as an example. Um, if an asset freeze in, is in place, there's certain actions that are prohibited and there are actions that have to be taken. So if you know or have reasonable cause to suspect that uh, a sanction is in place against a client or it, it uh, affects a particular transaction, then you are prohibited from dealing in, let's say it's an asset freeze, dealing in the frozen funds, uh, making funds or economic resources available or engaging in circumvent, circumventing action. These things are prohibited. You mustn't do them. And you must, as has already been said, have due diligence uh, mechanisms in place uh, to make sure you are not doing them. And that is because of the reasonable cause to suspect. So it's not just if you know or suspect, even if there is reasonable cause to suspect, but you don't suspect, for example, because you were negligent in having the, the appropriate due diligence mechanisms in place, then you could also be open to uh, liability for enforcement action. 
So that's what's prohibited. Then there are actions you need to take. And uh, under UK law, uh, you would be required to report your suspicions uh, to the OFSI. Um, so, so that's essentially the public law side of sanctions enforcement. There is also a private law side, which comes from the contracts you're entering into. Obviously, if you've entered into a contract, which you are required to perform, and a san sanction is put in place, making it very risky for you to perform the contract, then you need that contract to be able to give you a way out, i.e. Um, basically excuse you from performance in this situation. So it's really, really important to make sure that contracts are worded in a way that gives you that escape clause. Um, and this can be, thank you, uh, th this can be um, done in different ways. Uh, it, it's worth considering doing it in a broader way than just saying, if this becomes illegal, I won't do it. Um, also because it can be quite difficult to determine how illegal it is and to in what ways it is illegal. So to give you an example, uh, the Muir shipping case has been through four levels already of uh, um, procedures, uh, dispute resolution procedures uh, in this jurisdiction. It went from arbitration to the High Court to the Court of Appeal, and it's currently in the Supreme Court. It was just heard earlier this month, so we should the, a decision should be imminent. And each uh, um, forum kept reversing the other forum. And the question was, it's illegal to pay in dollars. Are we contractually bound to pay in a different currency? And it's a really difficult question. As you can see, four fora, uh, three of which have not agreed whether you need to still perform the contract in a different currency or not. So it, it is a really important question. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, we'll next move to Rebecca and speak a little bit about the policy environment in which we're seeing the law that Miriam described operates and the impact of that on trade flows. Cool. So um, we've already talked to some extent about um, the role of sanctions and warfare. Um, and I would suggest to you that actually at the moment, um, we're in a situation where economics and trade have effectively become securitized. In other words, what's different about this era of economic sanctions compared to where we have been right since 12th, second century BC or something, um, compared to where we have been is that now, economics and trade are effectively part of national security strategy. Now that means that it's not something that we can ignore. So we actually need to engage with government, would be my contention, not just regulators, but actually with government as well. Um, because the reality is, as Miriam and other speakers have highlighted, um, trade and trade conflict is a real thing, and the banks are effectively implementing policies. In other words, they are the foot soldiers in this conflict. Now, I'm a great strategist, um, studied um, international relations as well as economics. Don't worry, I've heard both of those quite well. Um, but it's not absolutely clear what overall strategic direction governments are taking with sanction strategy. So from a public policy point of view, um, part of it is to exclude countries like Russia and Iran from the economic system. Part of it is to limit access to finance so they can't fund military machines. But then, as, as was already pointed out, some of it as well is actually non-state actors. So some of it is terrorist financing as well. And it is an evolving landscape. And if anything at all, we are likely to see this becoming very complicated very soon um, because there are different mechanisms of economic and financial warfare that are beginning to be introduced. And within policy departments, and I don't think it's any secret really, um, we are beginning to see um, sanctions being used as a mechanism for deterring, to quote the government, disrupting and demonstrating our resolve at the moment. And those are the catchphrases of UK um, recent, very recent sanctions policy. But there's complexity there. 
Um, we're conflating financial crime and we're conflating foreign policy. And as soon as those two things start to get conflated, the conflict for banks is, well, am I dealing with financial crime here or am I actually dealing with the implementation of government policy? On both cases, the border between what is a non-state actor and a state actor is actually becoming very confused. So the relationship between financial crime and, um, and um, sanctions <coughs> as a means of coercing a state into different types of behaviours is becoming very complicated. Now, I could bore for England on this particular subject, but what I want to do is talk about the difference between circumvention, evasion, and trade diversion. And this is really important because it is a real paradox for policy implementers, at, implement, uh, policy makers at the moment. We talk in sanctions frameworks about circumvention. In other words, how do you dodge sanctions? We talk about evasion. There are deliberate acts to move around sanctions. But if I'm an economist and looking at this from an econ economics point of view, all it is is the outcome of a market failure. You have imposed something. You are, di you are imposing a sanction. What's going to happen? The trade will just go another way. Um, and that is exactly what is happening at the moment. So, for example, as has already been pointed out, Russia's trade has been growing since it initially collapsed back in 2022, particularly since the oil cap, because we found um, trade being diverted via other routes. Interesting thing on UK sanctions policy, imposed all trade embargoed against, <coughs> against Russia at the end of February 2022. By March... To, and, and Russia was our major gold importer. By March 2022, we were importing all of our gold from Kazakhstan, exactly the same amount, to the dollar, in, from Russia to switch to Kazakhstan. Now, that is something that's going on, and it's legal, illegal, right? I mean, it sanctions, it sanctions evasion and circumvention, but it is just diverting trade. So... What does this mean for banks? And this is my last set of, set of comments. Um, sorry. Banks have to implement this policy. It's confusing. We don't know entirely what government thinking is around this. They are still making it up. But it is part of international strategy. So it is becoming something that, if you like, one bunch of countries is using against another and it's affecting everything that we do. Where does the responsibility sit? Is it in compliance function? Or is it in the trade finance function? And I think there's a very important distinction there. There's a risk of sanctions arbitrage playing one sanction regime against another sanctions regime um, and, and actually not doing anything illegal during, in that process. And I think that's a really important thing that policymakers don't understand. Above all, my final point here is that governments haven't actually thought through the unintended consequences of imposing a bunch of sanctions um, in the trade finance world. And I've sat in meeting after meeting after meeting with policymakers, and they have no clue that this is a trade finance issue and that imposing sanctions, implementing the regime is a difficult thing to do. So actually, I do think now in the current more weaponized or securitized context, we do actually need tighter conversations. What is it for banks? It's a critical part of geopolitical risk management as well as compliance management. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so that's a great segue. What does this mean for banks? So last but not least, Anis. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, if I can go back to for the last two years, the way these sanctions have come out, um, they have been unprecedented, especially in three areas. Uh, of course, in Russia, we have been talking about that, that how those sanctions have increased, and then Belarus, and then Af also Afghanistan as well. So all that for the last two years, these sanctions have increased with the complexity and with the length of the um, time which is taken to, to process those transactions, it is challenging for the banks uh, uh, as well. But when you look at these the sanctions on Russia, um, and we see the overall sanctions which have happened for the last two years, 80% of those sanctions are the in the list they are come from Russia. So so we cannot ignore that fact that that is the challenge which banks have.
and it comes with all those different um, ways which Brad mentioned in his uh, uh, talk as well that the all the coast field or the dark fleet which are coming up in action as well. So that makes the <coughs> more complex as well. Um, for the banks, and then it comes to the different sanctions as well. There are UK sanctions, there are UN, UN sections, um, and then there are OFAC and US. So all combined, that, that when it comes to assessing them, it makes it very difficult for them. <coughs> what in banks we do, we use the technology, the tools, that, that how to combine all those sections and see that whether the transactions are within uh, the, the, the rules and the laws of the country as well. Though. So it, it, it is, if, if you look at it, that the way these sanctions are uh, enforced and also um, the way it is moving from entities to more on the individuals, mm -hmm. um, that's how the sanctions are becoming more difficult as well and the association with those entities as well um, and that's very difficult to find for the banks as well because association they are not named in any list there so then you have to go through all those kyc and the aml thing just like graham mentioned that it is knowing your customers you can have all those tools all those um, procedures there but if you don't know your customer that how they are transacting those transactions where is the transaction coming from and going to that, that that's where the challenges are coming through at the moment yeah. great thank you so i i heard complexity mentioned a few times both in this panel and, and the ones prior what do we really mean by the increasing complexity of the sanctions landscape um it, 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 from what we see in, in advising clients, there's really two main ways. One is the increasing number of sanctions regimes that are now out there. I think that was referred to in the earlier panels. You know, in the past, people often only thought of OFAC and U.S. sanctions, but then EU and U.K. sanctions increased. And now, after 2022, we're increasingly seeing Swiss sanctions and Canadian sanctions, which has come up now in a dispute between a European mm -hmm. supplier and a Russian importer. We have an issue that we have to advise relating to Canadian sanctions because of a Canadian individual involved. So there's navigating the, the, the nuances between these regimes. And there's another aspect of complexity, which, which was also brought up very well in the earlier panels on not just the comprehensive embargo where you cannot deal with a certain country. And it's no longer just you can't deal with a certain <coughs> individual or entity that's listed on a sanctions list. Now you have you know, export restrictions, import restrictions, you have new investment bans, and a lot of these aren't always so simple to apply. Um, so with that said, you know, I was wondering if, if, if the panelists could speak a little bit on either what's driving these changes that you see, the impact of them, and, and specifically on these, you know, what, how are banks dealing with that? Um, how are they dealing with that complexity um, through AML and KYC procedures? and what can be done to improve the efficiency and, and effectiveness of compliance? It's, it goes back to the, the knowing your customers and how they are doing the business from one country to the other. It was mentioned just like the, um, the oil, it is moving from Russia to different countries, but through different channels as well. Just like if you see the, in the case of India, refineries <coughs> there, but if you see the import of the oil and the output of the products which are coming up, there is no correlation between the two those. So you can see that the oil is coming in and then going out with, with, the, with, the, with the different country name on it there as well. So when looking at the transactions, I think there is a manual process, but at the same time, I think the, the going forward will be the AI based technology there. We have to use the technologies that, that how, how we can detect those sanctions, those, those pitfalls which are coming in. At Ghana International Bank, we use AI-based technology and all the other tools which they speak to each other though. So it's the, it's the manual process. When you do the manual process, 
they will be human at the end. So what we do, we 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 have the transactions or in incoming incoming uh, process comes in. It goes into the system. It goes to different uh, tools. So just like the screening, the dual use goods, uh, the vessel tracking, all they will speak to it, and then um, the technology brings you the solution there. But again, that you cannot rely on technology all the time, though. That it's a machine learning. The machine is still learning that that how they can come up with the with those um, elements which are uh, sanctioned there as well. So it's combination of the uh, human, the technology, and also knowing the customers as well. Great, thank you. Miriam, Rebecca, anything else on either complexity or technology that I just mentioned? Oh, well, I have to go on the complexity thing. Your original question was, um, what's driving this complexity? And I think um, it's an understanding on behalf of, um, uh, particularly since, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and we're seeing this in an economic sense, it's very, very different to what went on before. So, um, so there's a growing international realization that sanctions and export controls, but also industrial policy, and we haven't talked about industrial policy as such, but it's a new area. And these are areas that are being used to coerce, to influence, and to manipulate and create power over other countries. And I think while that remains almost a new domain of warfare, which I, you know, I argue that it is, I think I think you cannot ignore an economic dimension to warfare these days, you're going to see these instruments become more complicated. And one really important thing is that actually some of the things I referred to non-state actors when I spoke, some of the instruments that are being used to track and trace for example, terrorist activity are going to start being used in supply chains and across across. Now, that is something that is actively coming in. We're seeing it in sustainability policy and ESG policy, but we're also going to see it um, in, in, in the whole sort of AML KYC. And so that process of mapping a supply chain and understanding every single item of every single financial transaction within that is incredibly complicated. And what governments aren't necessarily thinking about when they're designing these strategies is how they're then going to be enforced and implemented. And so I think I think that's where the trade finance and the banking sector actually uh, and the banking sector need to get in contact with government and start doing that type of um, <coughs> not dropping even it's sitting behind closed doors and saying these are the things that are possible these are the things that are not possible for the very simple reason that you know we find it very difficult unless we're using technology to track where our supply chains are and what's flowing. Um, thanks. I mean, I, I see the the problem as as being sort of twofold. The first is the very age old problem that business has become international, but regulation and law has remained to a large extent local. So you're seeing a burgeoning of different regimes, as you say, a, a patchwork of regimes, which all may become relevant because if you're doing business internationally. Um, the second problem is that. <coughs> you're looking for enforcement to entities whose purpose is not enforcement of the law. Their purpose is to do business and generate a profit. Um, so essentially they're having to uh, adopt law enforcement techniques, identifying uh, breaches, identifying potential abuses, identifying circumventions, um, and uh, basically enforce the sanction uh, in the sense that they don't undertake any prohibited activities. So I, I guess the problem in my mind is, as, as Rebecca just said, are we doing this in a way that's going to actually achieve the outcomes we want? Um, because we are relying on private entities to perform public functions, i.e. law enforcement functions. Great, thank you. So now if, if we can uh, pull out our, our crystal balls and say, you know, we, we reconvene one year from now with, the, with uh, next year's ICC uh, masterclass, what what do you see? Um, what are the trends that, that you're observing? 
what developments are you expecting to to impact or or occupy trade finance professionals, sanctions practitioners um, in the next year? Understanding again, it's a very fluid environment, but I think we talked about some things here um, already. Technology, the development of technology, um, government policy, and 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 how uh, future sanctions programs and and, and laws may may increase or become further uh, defined and, and targeted. Um, but we can go ahead and and start down the line or whoever would like to go first. Okay, I'll go first. Um, nobody ever asks me what I think is going to happen in the future because I normally end up having to reach for a glass of whiskey and a bottle of aspirin afterwards. So, um, but but um, I mean, I wish I could say things were going to get easier and that everybody would be able, would be completely crystal clear on what's happening. But as we've seen over the last um, over the last couple of days of reporting, Rusi came out with a report today or yesterday saying that um, Russia is now explicitly providing oil in return for arms to North Korea. We know that's happening. What we are seeing, I mean, there have been rumours around it for a long time. Rusi has actually tracked the ship movements and the AIS signals and everything. So we know that this is a very complicated landscape and we know it's very uncertain. Other uncertainty we've got a US election coming up and um, I have, yeah, everybody's sort of going, oh my God. <laughs> um, so so we don't know what's going to happen to the sanctions landscape. Apparently war with Ukraine is going to be over in 24 hours, President Trump wins. So um, but, <laughs> um, it was like the trade wars are quick and easy to win. But I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be a year ahead that will be very, very difficult to navigate. I think industrial policy is 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 kind of the elephant in the room because if you look at the commerce, if you look at the commerce department, it's actually implementing all of those technology measures. They aren't even on the trade finance radar screen as such, but certain circumventions, certain difficulties about trading with certain companies because of technologies and military grade technologies. We all know about washing machines from Kazakhstan into into Russia, but there are there are going to be a lot more of those examples floating around because actually identifying in an interconnected world where something originates and you have to have a rules of origin certificate somewhere in order to be able to circumvent in order to be able to say definitively about sanctions, you can't do that within the complex of life. <coughs> so I think this is going to get worse, a lot worse before it gets better. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure how to follow that. <laughs> I was going to say that uh, one thing that um, uh, I think about is perhaps over reliance on technology because the landscape is so complex that, as as Annie said, we we cannot but rely on technology um, to help us navigate it. Uh, but I do worry about cognitive biases, over-reliance on technology, and uh, if the computer says it, it must be true sort of mentality, because liabilities <clears throat> aren't on the AI, liabilities are on individuals, liabilities are on entities. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it can be dangerous to over-rely on, on technology, but... Uh, sorry, I, I, I'm I'm just as worried as Rebecca, actually. I think it's the supply chain as well. Because of the supply chain, the the parts are coming from one part of the world and going to uh, to another part, and you, you cannot determine that what is the actual origin of those goods are there as well. And that's that's where the more challenge. Okay. If we see anything, though, I mean, if you see your iPhone, if you look at the back of it, it says designed by Apple in California, <laughs> assembled in China. So what is the origin of this phone, though? So how would you determine that, that whether chip is from China or, or somewhere else as well? So all these complexities, when they come in, about, with, with the technology as well, and the regulators as well, they are getting so tough on everything though. And for that, I think it won't be easy. It will, um, maybe sanctions, they will ease down on some countries with some individuals coming in and, and there's no war. 
but then it will drill down to the individuals though, and that will become more challenging for the banks as well to, to go through all that manual process of the technology coming in and coming with the solutions as well. But the, as you said, technology is sometimes if we, when we do screening, you will have more, so many false positives coming in. Then you have to go through each item though and look at it that which one is correct, which one is not. And that's what regulator is looking for, that you don't, you have the policies, you have the procedures, but at a transactional level, you have to look at it as well. So I think that, that challenge will remain, compliance will be there, business has to be done there as well. So there has to be all those controls in place at the same time you have to run the business as well. Great, thank you. Those are all great points. If, if I had to add my two cents, I would say the bad news is once you've released a lot of sanctions, it's often harder to put it back into the bottle. Um, so they're still going to remain. There may be areas where it decreases, but even the change itself is an adjustment that practitioners have to adjust to. The other piece of bad news, I guess, is there's often a delay in the implementation of sanctions and the enforcement. And we see a lot of the government regulators and agencies have staffed up significantly. This is not just in the US, but also UK and EU. So we're, we're, we're already seeing increases um, in questions that companies are receiving and um, in potential enforcement actions. I would finish with the good news. One is technology is continuing to develop, and I think we have a panel on that later. Um, so we'll hear more on that. And then the second piece is that um, after the experience of the last two, few years, you know, sanctions compliance has gotten the attention of a lot of executives and a lot of uh, upper management in companies. And so there's a lot more careful attention to these issues. And we're, at, we're seeing a lot more questions from clients about contingency planning, asking about what might happen next, uh, what can we do in advance to mitigate our risk? Um, and so in that sense, you know, one were to hope that the next time there's some kind of crisis, folks would be in a better position and better prepared. Um, but thank you very much um, for all your input. This is a very excellent panel.